Good morning or afternoon, everyone. I'm Jeffrey Moss from Parker Dewey. Really excited that you can join us for our quarterly state of campus recruiting call. Uh, obviously, we are in a crazy pseudo post COVID environment where campus recruiting and campus itself is starting to feel normal. Students are returning to campus, people are returning to the office, but there's obviously a ton going on, not just around this post COVID world, but the financial world as well. A lot of uncertainty causing companies to cut budgets. They're going through layoffs. And on top of it, there's continuing questions with regard to post-secondary education that we can all see in the news. Um, questions around, do we need college degrees? How do we ensure equitable pathways from post-secondary education to the real world? Um, and are students ready for work? And the result is that companies spending per hire continues to increase. The stats I recently saw from NACE were pretty incredible. Um, it's happening because companies continue to compete for the same candidates and they're trying to figure out how to get through the noise while students are getting left behind. On top of it all, we're seeing increasing attrition by new hires. Um, while all this go is going on, both companies and colleges are being held more accountable uh, even when resources are getting cut. So with that lead in today, I'm really excited to talk with Debbie and Allison and hopefully I'll do very little talking and they'll do most of it. Real quickly, by way of introductions, Debbie leads internships and experiential learning at Western Connecticut State University. It's a public university with about 4,400 students across a variety of majors, very diverse student population with 44% of the students coming from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. I'm so excited that Debbie will be able to share some of what she's hearing both with the school itself and what she's hearing on the ground from the students. And Allison Keefe leads the Emerging Talent Program at Smith & Nephew. It's a $5 billion global medical equipment uh, company based in the UK. They have about 17,000 employees, uh, including four large offices in the United States. And I asked Debbie and Allison to do this with us this quarter because both of their organizations have a breadth of different needs and stakeholders. They're also both in that sweet spot. And what I mean by that is neither organization is so massive or so small that their challenges or learnings are unique, but rather everything that they're seeing and doing is truly applicable to organizations and colleges, irrespective of how small or large they are. So I'm gonna stop talking. Debbie, do you wanna tell us just a quick bit about your roles and responsibilities at Western Connecticut to set the stage? Sure. Um, I'm a um, licensed guidance counselor and I'm the associate director here for the Career Success Center at WestCon. Um, I'm also in charge of the internship program for primarily all of the business students, which include um, computer science, MIS, management, uh, communication, marketing, all, all the liberal arts type majors. Um, and I work with um, many students, like many, I'm talking like up to hundreds of students every semester, encourage them to do internships, um, consider doing micro internships to start building their, their resume and their experience, um, and just supporting their career services needs. No, that's great. And Allison, to again, set the stage a bit, early career is obviously so different across every company. What are some of the things you're responsible for at Smith Nephew? Yeah, so thank you so much, Jeffrey. I really appreciate being here, especially among all of the recruiters and campus representatives that are on the line today. Um, just just as a, a quick uh, background, I do have I have a master's in higher education, and I started working on college campuses before I um, turned switched over to the co the corporate world. So I just wanted to make sure that people understood that when you hear what I'm saying today, a lot of what I'm I'm saying is based in that framework. The decisions I make, how I interact with students, the programs that we develop, all have that um, background of having that education prior to starting um, in the corporate world. At Smith & Nephew, I'm the Director of Emerging Talent. We're a global organization, as Jeffrey said, we're in 100 different countries. And part of what I do, there are three major things that I do. I help to develop our campus recruiting strategies and framework globally. So I help us to determine what we look like when we go to campus, how we go to campus, who goes to campus, when we go to campus, all of those types of things for us, for China, for uh, Malaysia, for India, uh, for the UK. 
And of course, I have a lot of uh, team members that work with me, but that the recruitment piece is very important to me. The second piece, and that we get that right. The second piece is that I lead our uh, experiential learning programs, as well as our leadership development programs. So again, I helped to set that structure to make sure when students come in and partner with us and take a job with us, whether it's an internship or a full-time position, we're really meeting the needs of the students and that they know when they're joining Smith and Nephew, our intern program is going to be like this, no matter what function they're joining, no matter where they're joining it. The third hat that I wear, which is um, near and dear to my heart, is that I help to lead for our entire talent acquisition team. So not just the emerging talent, but for our entire um, talent acquisition team, our inclusion, diversity, and equity efforts. So examples of that include our lead, our uh, relationship with the Society of Women Engineers, as well as the National Society of Black Engineers. And just recently in the past year, I rolled out a inclusion, um, a reducing bias in the hiring process training program for 2,500 people leaders around the world. Wow. It was in seven different languages, um, 20 different in, 21 different interactive sessions we hosted. So those are the types of things um, that I do at Smith & Nephew as, as the director. Wow. Well, you, you hit something. Again, obviously Smith Neff, Smith & Nephew is a, a large organization, but you're not the size of the big four. You don't have yeah. a recruit, you don't have a recruiting team um, of one that that's built to sort of recruit thousands and thousands and thousands of students every year. I mean, what are some of those challenges you face given that you're not recruiting one or two interns or new hires every year, but you're also not recruiting 3000? I, I feel like that some of the challenges um, externally to, to start off with is our brand awareness. So I was talking earlier about um, a robot that we have that can do surgeries and there might be one person on the phone that has heard of Smith and Nephew prior to this call today, but we don't, we're not a household brand. And when you think about it, I mean, how many people on the call do you know, or do you know someone that has had a knee replacement or they've had some type of orthoscopic surgery? But I would ask how many people know what knee product was put into their knee or what shoulder instrument was used to do the, scop the orthoscopic surgery or even to heal a wound. And so we are not a household product and we are up against some of the bigger companies like a, like a um, Stryker, Medtronic, uh, other companies that you can think of. And so what we do is we definitely take a multiple prong approach to our recruitment efforts externally. We use obviously uh, the micro internship, the Parker Dewey platform has given us exposure to thousands of people. Today, even being able to participate in this, I, I feel like this is just such a, an amazing opportunity for me to be able to talk about Smith and Nephew and the things that we do. That's one example. We partner quite a bit with um, school clubs as well. I feel like that's one of the best ways for us to, at a minimal price, to get to the students that we're interested in, in working with. And we um, interact with the breadth of those student clubs. Um, I'm, we're not the type of company that throws you know, $30,000 at a school so that we can have a name roomed after us. We take a real bottoms up approach to this. So utilizing those student clubs at a minimal fee pizza or whatever it is. Um, and we do, we do get a lot of, um, of, of, what would I say, opportunity to educate the students too. So we're not doing direct recruiting efforts. We're educating them like at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville business students, um, the, the Women in Business Club invited us to talk about how to leverage your internship program, how to, how to, what's the first day like, and we really educated them, and after that, we've got a lot of students interested in us as a company. I well, could go on for a little bit. Yeah, I want to hit something on that, because again, you brought up a really interesting point. You talked about um, students may not have heard of Smith Nephew, but they heard of Stryker. The reality is, though, aren't you to some extent also competing, if you will, against companies that weren't thinking about the medical device space? They want to do marketing and think they have to go to P and G, yeah. or they want to do they want to work on robots and think they have to work at a startup in Silicon Valley. No, I, I appreciate that point, and that is a really, really good point because when I talk with students about those opportunities, so you can do supply chain anywhere, right? You can do it at Boeing, you could do it at P and G, you could do it at Coca Cola which is one of my favorite brands, um, but you could do that anywhere. But when I talk with students about what's important to them, what matters to them, 
and I share with them what our culture pillars are, um, what our values are as an organization, and that's care, collaborate, um, and, and show courage in the work that we do. And I give them examples of how we're walking the walk and being very authentic in that. All of a sudden you can see the light like dawn in their eyes. And, and again, from the perspective that I take, I take a lot of time with students and I talk with students. I don't want people to join Smith and Nephew if they're not interested, but I want them to understand that having a uh, an alignment with your values with whatever company you join is really, really important and to dig well. deep on that. And I want to hit something, and again, uh, Debbie, I want to hit something that Allison said, where she said she's not, uh, Smith and Nephew's not in a position that they can write the $30,000 check to, to cross a whole bunch of schools to sponsor them, which is probably a situation a lot of organizations are in. Um, and she also gave some really creative strategies to, again, engage the students. What are you actually hearing from the students? What's working, what's not? to actually get the students' attention? You know, we've had to continuously change the way we reach out to students. Um, we're continuously trying new ideas and techniques. Um, in the past, we would have workshops and we would have career fairs and everybody would show up. When we were in college, we would go to these events because we knew that it was important to prepare ourselves for our career. Students these days, they don't find the need Right now, they don't think right now that they need to do these preparations. So we've had to be creative. We continue to do the career fairs. We continue to offer workshops and we continue to go in classrooms and, and talk with students. But that's why micro internships are so important because when COVID started, practically all of my interns were sent home and told that they couldn't go to work anymore. And they signed, they were paying money for academic credit to complete yeah. their internships. So we had to find ways to be, uh, to think outside the box and make it work for them. Stu some students tell me that they want the old fashioned way. They wanna go and work in person. And other students tell me that they would rather do it in the comfort of their own home and still get that valuable experience and get paid and do short projects and have something put on their resume. So I'm constantly working with students from all over the spectrum. And being that our students are primarily um, lower, uh, underrepresented, um, they are first generation students. I was a first generation student. I didn't know what questions to ask. I didn't know where to look for internships. Um, there were internships I wanted to do, being that I lived in Connecticut, I was studying broadcasting. The internships I wanted to do, I couldn't go do them because I couldn't go live in California and I couldn't go live in New York City. So I had to make the best of what I have. Right yeah. now, students are lucky. They have micro internships. They have these, these opportunities at their fingertips. And it's, it's a culture that we're building. It's only been, you know, two years now. They're slowly learning about it. And I'm talking about it everywhere I go. When I'm walking on campus and I meet students, when I'm in the cafeteria and I'm meeting with students, when I'm working with a student in my office, when I'm teaching a class. And we also have what we call a career success center pop-up booth. So when it's nice outside, we have two of these pop-up booths uh, branded with our school logo and our colors. Um, and we have two campuses in different parts of the city we will pop up these booths and meet the students where they are. We can well, accept you, them. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, you were, you were saying something. Oh. I really want to dig in, dig into it. And I appreciate the kind words about the micro internship. So, so thank you for that. Um, but really want to dig into something. I heard a great quote, I think it was last week or the week before that a student said about they, they don't want um, sort of career exploration events where they're getting the same information they can Google. They right. want something yeah. different. Yeah. Um, and I guess part of what I'm trying to understand is, is that why they're not really engaging? Because it feels like those career fairs and info sessions are really just the same stuff they could read from a website? Um, primarily, yes. And, and we're learning that students now have a lot of anxiety. They have a lot of anxiety and they don't reach out until they need to reach out. And usually that's after graduation. We try to encourage them as soon as they come in here, as soon as they're an accepted student and they come with their parents to accepted student day. We're telling them about micro internships, about getting experience, about the avenue that they think they might want to pursue. 
um, take, take, um, do micro internships, do, do any type of internship, get some experience to see if the industry you want to work in is even what you expect. And well, go ahead. Oh, no, please. Sorry. <laughs> It, it, it's you know every student is different you know and 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 I'm sure next year things are going to be a little bit different but right now we we do what we can and it's an ongoing message. Allison, were you going to add something? Sorry, I keep on cutting oh, no, people no, no. off. No, I just agree. I agree. I, you I mean, have to go where the students are. Well, and and that's where again, as I'm in. By the way, a stat I saw, and, and I'm going to screw up the exact number, but Mary Scott from Scott Research Group had some great data talking about 50% or so of students are blocking recruiting emails now mm -hmm. uh, because they're getting inundated. And, and Mary will yell at me for not having the right disclaimers tied to it. But but the fact is students are blocking, um, are blocking emails. They're not showing up to events unless they're already planning to apply mm -hmm. because it's not really that interesting. And, and part of what I'm hearing, I guess, Debbie, from what you're saying and Allison, um, from what you were hitting on is really like, Students want to, one, start to learn about the company and companies want to make sure students are aware of it. Two, how do we make sure students have access to those opportunities, whether it's for companies that may not be able to be on campus physically or if there are events that they can't participate because of other obligations, and then ultimately improving the hiring outcomes. And I really want to think along those three categories because there's very much an overlap between the needs and goals of students and companies. So I guess starting on the awareness side, and Allison, you were hitting on this before, you're not spending 30, 50, 100 grand on campus recruiting efforts. How are you making sure students are aware of Smith Nephew beyond the ones who are already sort of raised their hand and said, yes, I want to work for a medical device company? Yeah, again, um, just going back very quickly, we do take a multiple prong approach and we use um, different ways to connect with students in terms of the national conferences that's one example. We have a very small footprint there, but we leverage the large footprint that other companies have. So we get to have the opportunity to interact with students that have never heard us of us. They see us doing our robotic demonstration. And then just the pictures of people. And the, it, it's just amazing to see the crowd that kind of forms around us. That's the, that's the wow. first thing we do. And again, we take a very, um, we have a small footprint at these events. And we use our business partners to help support us. That's an important part of me being able to do my job. And that's having a relationship with them so that they help to one, purchase the booth and purchase the, give us the money to be able to go, give us the people to be able to go. And then the business gets really bought into, especially inclusion, diversity, and equity. That's something that's really, really important to me. So whether it's the National Society of Black Engineers or if it's just being on campus at the, um, the women in business at uh, the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, that's another example. But just utilizing my business to help get the word out there about what we do. And then finally, we use LinkedIn, we use external markets, um, we use Parker Dewey's website. I use that all the time just so I can I get a. <laughs> Sorry, I know it's not, not a commercial, but it is, it is truthful. We've had um, people come through. Uh, one example of it is we were hiring um, people for a brand new sales leadership development program that we were running. And rather than going on campus, which is what our salespeople wanted to do all over the United States. Instead, what I said, we can do this in a very cost-effective way. We can put a project on Parker Dewey. We can reach out to students that we would have never, ever had the opportunity to interact with. Um, Kansas State, Kent State, um, High Point University, um, a school out in California. And for $200 a project, we were able to assess who we were gonna hire full-time and join us. And we've hired 12 people that way over the past year and a half. Um, one of whom has been, all of them have been incredibly successful. I got off the phone yesterday with one of the vice presidents who's leading it and said that they're killing it. They love it. And just being at these different universities brings us a breath of diversity into our organization as well. One of the students won a national award in front of hundreds of salespeople because of the extra work that she was putting into. Oh my God. Um, yeah, um, doing her work. So it's just phenomenal, the, the talent, the quality of talent for a minimum price 
that Parker Dewey can bring in. And honestly, our salespeople love it because it gives us, it's a win-win. It gives the students an opportunity to practice pitching in front of real salespeople that give them feedback and help them. And it gives our salespeople the opportunity to see what a student can actually do, not talk about what they can do, but what they can actually do. So well, I um, wanna, that's just one example. Yeah, and I wanna hit on that for a second because we got a question about how long in, in the chat, how long it took to start to see the results and what the ROI was. And you talked about the projects were 200 bucks. So again, these are $200 going into the pockets of the students, by the way. This isn't $200 spent on advertising or pizza or something. Students were getting paid. I think, how many did you say you hired from that business development, 12? So we hired 13. You hired 13. Yeah. Full time. And then how, how many did projects, just out of curiosity? Was it like 20? 20 about 20 did the projects so you can see the return on investment is just incredible so it was i'm not se sending salespeople to go to an event and spend four hours talking to event because that's money too right that's direct wait. money out of our pockets so. i just want to make sure i understand this because i hadn't heard these numbers before so it's about 20 students give or take 200 per project so so the total cost was four thousand dollars and you hired 13 students for full-time roles some of the students came to us through relationships that I had met on campus, but they still did the project. We still paid them because we want to have a, a similar process for everyone. But yes. Oh my um, God. Yeah, the, it's staggering. And the for me, it's a win-win again for the students because they get to practice and they get to learn. And for my hiring managers, they love it. They love interacting with the students. They love the fact that they don't necessarily have to go to a campus. Um, and they get to see what the student can actually do. And they know, you know, the students aren't perfect at this, right? But it's great because we get to see how we can mentor and help them when they do join us. So it's been a phenomenal partnership. And, and my numbers are are approximate, but those are the, those are almost the Order numbers. Order of magnitude. Yeah, you yeah, don't want to share 12. any secret sauce. Yeah. yeah. Well, Fair enough. I mean, that that's, I, I just, even if it was double that, even if it was $8,000 to recruit 12 yeah. students, that's pretty That's pretty insane. And it sounds like they're all still with you, all 13? Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. The cost per hire is incredibly low and the, the yield is amazing. Wow. Debbie, I mean, what do you, I, I mean, I'm, I'm blown. I hadn't heard this in the prep call or any of that, those metrics. I mean, what's your reaction, Debbie? That that Allison was able to get that that many students and 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 get a lot of work done. I think is fantastic. I mean, that's the whole the whole the whole purpose of utilizing Parker oh Dewey is so we can <laughs> make the most of our time. I mean, it's only me and one other person in our office, and we can't be everywhere all the time and do what we need to do. I mean, our resources are stretched very thin. Parker Dewey makes it so much easier for everybody else. Um, and I love it when students come to me and they say, I want to get experience doing computer science, but nobody will hire me because I don't have any of that experience. Oh, yeah. And I say, do do some do do micro internship. There are a ton of those types of short projects that you can work on and have something to put on your resume. And then when a student comes back to me and says, I did a project and it really, really helped. And, and it's going to open up so many doors. And I say, do do more projects. You know, you can you can do something in a week and get paid for it. And you need to do you our students because they're first generation and many of them are commuter students. They can't they don't have the luxury of living on campus and wow. doing things the way students at Miami University or UConn might be able to do it. They have to work. They have to work part time. They have to make some money. I say if you're going to be working in. Um, working at a part-time job and making money, you might as well do a do a micro internship, get well, the experience and get paid at the same time for a shorter amount of time, and 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 you're still putting your time to good use. Well, and I want to hit. There's two things you said, and I want to hit both of them, Debbie. Um, without me getting distracted, so sorry about that. Um, the first is you talked about um, you. you you talked about some of the other schools not having the size of the Yukon or the historical relationships of a Yale, if you will. Or the support of the faculty. Or well, that's that that was actually my second. Yep. So one would love to hear how career services, just in general, um, I know you were placed under the academic affairs department recently. 
how the engagement with the faculty has been just overall, nothing to yeah. do with the micro internship, just overall how that's been. Um, and then we can talk about other specific schools. Sure. So um, in the past, for, for up to this point, up until about a month ago, our office was under student affairs. And we were we were working on reaching out to the faculty. We would send them emails. And we didn't seem to get any response or partnership with them. Just recently, we were placed under academic affairs, and now the faculty is starting to come around. Um, we're being invited more into all of their classrooms to do individual workshops. And they want to know all about what, what is career services? What do you do at the Career Success Center? And it's um, I, I see a change. It's, it's starting to happen. Every week, we're included in the faculty's newsletter. I also have um, a, a working group. We call it the ELWIG, the Applied Learning Working Group, which more staff and faculty on campus come to our meetings, which we have several times a, a semester, to talk about how students can get experience in applied learning and experiential learning. We share resources like, like Parker Dewey. Um, we talk about things that students need to be prepared, skills they need to be aware of, things that employers are looking for. Um, and, and we're building a culture. I see it. This is the very first semester. It's not a complete semester yet. And I, I'm slowly seeing things start to change and it's going to take a while and it's a culture that we're building but because we're not one of those big schools like UConn faculty has they've never really taken an interest in in what we do because they had their marching orders and and now we're coming together and I think it's going to be fantastic I'm, I'm excited about it no it's it's great to hear um and I want to I want to also Build because again the, the faculty involvement is always a, a tricky thing. Yeah. How do you get faculty involved without forcing it? How do you get them involved if they're concerned about too much? Um, call it vocation versus academic scholarship. And it sounds like you have some great approaches that have really brought them to the table. We try to make it fun. Every semester we have what we call the faculty and staff open house. So people can come up into our office and for a day we'll play games, we'll share resources with them, um, we'll do mini workshops, and we try to make it fun. And, and, and we continue to have alumni events. Um, we're, yeah. trying to, we're trying to do so many different things. And it's like throwing spaghetti to the wall, whatever sticks works. <laughs> well, it's also, it sounds like a lot of things you're doing are complementary. They're not replacing. You're not going into the classroom and forcing it, yeah. but rather helping the professors and faculty see. I want to hit on the other topic you said, though. I mean, again, to your point, you don't have the scale or the resources or the historical relationships of a UConn or of a Yale. Um, it has nothing to do with academic um, quality or anything. Or I just want to be very transparent. Um, how are you? How are you driving more employers to engage with your students? Because at the end of the day, if the employers aren't there, whether it's virtually or on site or whatever, it mm -hmm. becomes that much more challenging for the students. You know, it's so hard because if I'm working with students and I tell them, you think about doing an internship. Think about the top 10 employers that you think you might want to work with and they go on handshake and they don't see any opportunities that the employers have listed on handshake. They're going to come back to me and say, why should I use handshake? There's nothing interesting to me on there or the same with the employer. I want the employer to know that our students are prepared and ready to hit the ground running and work for them. If I don't have any students connected with the employers, the employers are going to be like, why should I work with you because you're not giving me what I need? So it's 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 a tricky balance. And like I said before, we're always trying to come up with different ways to get everybody involved. What we just um this year is the first year where we've had career fairs at the mall, which is right down the street from us, where we would invite the public. So wow. it makes me feel a little bit more comfortable and confident knowing that the employers that come to our career fairs aren't going to have to depend on our students, but the public is there in case they want to meet the public as well. But because it's so exciting to be at the mall, more and more students are showing up. And we were surprised to see that. And employers are saying, you know, being at the mall, this is fantastic. So that's, we're going to continue to do that. Yeah. Uh -huh. But well, if I, I don't have students and I don't have employers, you know, 
there's a need, well, but. Well, I mean, that's ultimately the challenge. Yeah. It's, that, it, that students <laughs> want opportunities and employers want to hire, but you have this ma matchmaking yeah. mismatch, if you will. And by the way, I have to give a shout out to you in Western Connecticut. There is an incredible program being funded by a very large foundation that's actually sponsoring micro internships for students who attend university at Western Connecticut and other colleges and universities across Connecticut and Florida. So if there's anyone on the call that um, wants to sort of dip their toe in the water, whether it's around getting to know students at Western Connecticut or micro internships, or even just has a small project, let us know because these are fully funded by this foundation because they believe in, in the power of this. It's pretty cool. And, and thank you so much, Jeffrey and, and Kristen and, and all the people at Parker Dewey for, for connecting us with that and helping us with that. When I have my career fairs, I literally go to every single employer table and I hand them out your marketing materials. And I tell them, you know, sometimes this works. You know, I mean, sometimes getting a student to work for you in person may work for you, but you can also get a lot of work done by doing a micro well, internship. And Allison, I want to I want to hit on that point, though, because I know you're using remote projects, but it's not a replacement for in person roles. No, we, we do still have a really strong internship program that we host at multiple sites within the United States and actually globally. And we hire for all different functions as well. In 2020, we paused um, and, and had to move to the Parker Dewey obviously platform that that's when you and I started our partnership was which was phenomenal but we still do year round have um, micro internships we offer them year round and then we offer our summer intern program as well as co-op yeah. programs apprentice programs and trainee programs and I really want to hit on that point because again when we and, and this isn't about micro internships specifically but just in general I want to I want to dig in when we think about these short-term discrete projects that are remote they're not meant to be a replacement for the 10 week on site summer internship, a replacement for the full time on site role. It's meant to be just another way to engage, assess, build relationships with students, very much top of funnel, students who may not be showing up to the career fair info session. And obviously, for some students who can't participate in summer internships for other reasons, right. it's a reasonable um, sort of second, if you will. But again, it's not meant to to replace the in-person. I just really wanted to dig in on that. Yeah, and I tell uh, everybody, this is a supplement. This this is yeah. added bonus to building your personal brand. Yeah, I guess one of the other questions for Allison is you talked about um, you talked about diversity earlier, which I know is very, very top in mind for probably everyone on this call. Um, how are you? How are you driving the diversity within Smith and Nephew, especially given the budget constraints, especially you can't be at all of the schools and it's great that you were at Nesby, but you obviously can't visit all of the HBCUs. You can't necessarily visit all of the small schools. Are, are you finding it challenging to drive more diversity and what are some of the things you're doing? We work really hard. It is challenging. It's very challenging and, and a lot of companies, many, many, many companies, all companies are doing this right now because they realize the value in bringing in a, a diver, diver, diverse workforce and how that helps um, your culture, um, everything within your organization right down to your revenue. But what's, what's important to me and how we do it is we do use our employee inclusion groups significantly. And right now we have 11 employee inclusion groups focused on different areas, neuro diversity, um, ethnicity, uh, women in, um, in STEM and those types of programs. And we have our employee inclusion groups go out to high schools, meet with students, um, go to uh, local colleges and campuses to do presentations. We host treks. So we invite multiple campuses to come in and visit our, our organization and see what we're actually doing and hear from recent grads and hear from hiring managers about what we do. And so we really are trying to take um, this approach where I'm a, a one person um, team um, to use our employee inclusion groups. And that has been phenomenally successful. They love working with high school students. They love getting in the classroom, hosting um, different types of competitions, as, as well as um, just being able to share their experience through mentorship programs as well. So um, and we work with, um, in, in Memphis, for instance, there's an organization called um, First Memphis that 
or works with all of the interns that come from uh, all different schools wow. across the United States to all of the companies. And we work collaboratively. I think that that's another um, example with First Memphis. We will do presentations, but we work with the other companies in the area because it's a little bit of a challenging location to get people to. Um, and, and, and finally, we just really try to um, ensure that students that are um, representing different backgrounds feel comfortable within our, our recruiting process and share that with other, uh, other students and other people that are experiencing uh, the, the process with us. I, I think the word of mouth has been huge for us. So those are and the I wanna, questions. No, this is helpful. And, and I know um, on the employee resource group side, we've also seen some really, really creative ways where um, companies are using the ERGs um, where they're offering, again, the opportunity to post and, and work with college students on these short-term projects almost as a perk. Mm -hmm. Here's a way to get help on projects that you have on your own plate, whether it's tied to your work with the ERG or in general, but also as a way to create these equitable pathways and build relationships with students from diverse backgrounds, which is not only viewed as a perk by the existing employees, but the students actually were, were hearing from them feel much more connection to that company and they feel like mm -hmm. diversity is more than a talking point or a banner or something on the website. They're actually working with individuals from similar backgrounds, which is just so important. Um, I want to I want to continue on the diversity front because again, a, a specific question that came in around neurodiverse students, students with different um, um, learning differences or other disabilities. Um, what are you, I mean, Debbie, what are some of the challenges you're seeing with students who face those challenges on campus at Western Connecticut? Um, you mean challenges that they may have? The challenges they're having sort of in that, in that transition yeah. to the workforce. Yeah, Sorry, I wasn't so, clear. Um, I don't know the exact numbers of those students on our campus, but I do work with them daily. And I, I always encourage them, think about doing a micro internship. We also have we have campus resources that will help students if the students are willing to use these researches, I mean resources, um, to help the students understand what's expected of them and how they can be successful in collaboration to us. So when I'm working with the students, I always encourage them to go to, um, for us, it's called accessibility, work with your accessibility office as well so you can get the maximum benefit that you need in order to work a career and be successful at that. Um, you know, every, like I said before, every student's yeah. different and, and we have to continue to think outside the box cool. in order to help them be successful. But, and a lot of times, and you'll read it in all of the research, students have a lot of anxiety about going out there and getting experience, especially these, these types of um, diverse students. So we have to meet them where they're at and not force them well. to do things the old fashioned way. Yeah. yeah, and I want to, oh, sorry, Allison, were you going to add something? I, no, I want to hit, oh, go ahead. I keep up. I was just going to say, no, I, I agree 100%. We need to think about doing things differently. And we need to encourage our hiring managers mm -hmm. to think about doing things differently as well. So in the reducing bias training that we did, we really talked about this um, population um, to think about the skills that are required for the job, not the handshake and not the mm -hmm. eye contact. Right. Those things aren't the important things. It's really, does the student have the skill to do this? Yeah. And and once we, we do have the opportunity to bring in candidates, we need to think about the onboarding process. How do we make it as comfortable and as um, opening and welcoming to them? And we have an employee inclusion group, I talked about this earlier, that's very active, that's focused in this area to help ensure that people feel that are currently at the company and people that come into the company feel comfortable in having their, um, their needs met. Um, so, well, yeah, I mean, it's it's retraining, but it's retraining beyond having the employees sit and watch the VHS tape. It's actually giving them real exposure right. to real individuals. But, you I know, these, can I, oh, sorry, can I add ahead. something? No, please. These individuals, you know, they're very intelligent and they've got incredible hard skills. It's just a matter of understanding the soft skills. And, and sometimes they just need a little guidance, you know. Um, having someone who's patient enough to hold their hand and just say, you know, you can't stand and talk to somebody in their office all day long. They've got some work to do. It's kind of time to move on. Um, it's it's the soft skills that we're helping them build, but otherwise they're fantastic with the hard skills. And I want to hit on something. There was a great comment in the chat about um, 
how micro internships can provide a nice inroad for introverted students. Oh, yeah. The reason I want to hit on that is we do a survey of students after they complete projects asking about their skill development and we do it relative to the NACE core competencies, so communication, professionalism, et cetera. But one of the questions that we started to ask a couple of years ago wasn't just, do you feel like your skills improved or not in what level, but how is your confidence? Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that really stood out. The, the feedback on confidence improvement was off the charts, mm -hmm. um, where students were feeling like, even if I didn't improve my communication skills, like I, I felt they continued to be strong or, or whatever level, I feel more confident with them. These discrete projects really help them build up their confidence. Um, and you realize how important it is for all students, but especially those from populations that are underrepresented in the workforce. So it, that was one of the great, um, the great surprises. Um, I wanna try, we're, we're about 20 minutes left. I wanna try to get through some of the questions that came in both in the chat and beforehand. So one of the questions, and this is for both of you, and, and Allison, we'll start with you. We have employers insisting on in-person recruitment events despite student attendance and engagement virtually. We're frustrated with both sides of this equation, employers who won't recognize about the facts about virtual and students who refuse to attend in person given their own choices. I guess where, where I come out of the question is, what are your thoughts about virtual recruiting events or virtual recruiting broadly defined versus in person? I have I have a love hate relationship with both. <laughs> we need both. We need to make both work. Um, I love going on campus. I love meeting with students in person. But I know a lot of students won't come to that. I'm not as comfortable in the virtual arena. Um, but we know that we we have successful events all year round with um, students on a virtual platform. So we leverage both. And we again, I said this earlier. I try to meet where the students are and where we can be at. So an example of this is just recently we were on a panel. Um, we couldn't get to the campus. Um, so they let us be on the panel virtually and it worked out very, very well. So I, I think, again, we need to be f flexible in how we recruit students and be where the students are, yeah. the student clubs and where they need us to be. Whether it's in the classroom in person or virtually, that's another venue that we really try to um, use quite a bit. I, I'm trying to have our team our um, business managers think about doing things more often virtually so we can get to more campuses and meet more students from different types of campuses. So that's something that we're moving towards. I, I, I really, I'm a traditional recruiter, campus recruiter, but being more agnostic about the schools that we go to and the students that we bring in, I think is the wave of the future. And we're, we're just working our way towards that. But I love being on campus and uh, I'm, I'm getting better at being virtual and, and encouraging our, um, our, our teams. We have school teams to be virtual as well. Debbie, what's your take both from the students and what you're hearing from employers? 100% of what Allison said. Before we hit COVID, I would go and I would ask my employers at our career fairs, would you consider doing a virtual career fair? This was before COVID even happened. And all the employers said, no, I don't want to do a virtual career fair. You can't get a sense of someone's body language or, or, or you know, their, their, their body language and, and, and their confidence. And I don't want to do virtual career fairs. And then we were forced to do virtual career fairs and we had to make the best of it. And even while we were still in the midst of COVID, I'm a, uh, I am I like the in-person career fairs. I yeah. tried to do both. <laughs> yeah. And we saw exactly what Allison said. You have those students who want to continue doing things in person. And then you have those students who want to do it virtually. So you can't take either one away right now because then you're not going to be reaching those students who really desire what it is you're taking away. And as technology continues to change and develop and upgrade, this is the future. You know, if you're not on board with what's happening, you're going to be left behind. And that's what I tell our faculty members as well. well it's as easy as that. And I'm, I'm going to share my own opinion on this, even though I'm trying not to opine. Um, I think being on campus is a really great way to build relationships with students. I think that's what students are hungry for, those real relationships and those insights beyond what they could otherwise Google. I think all too often the career fair events, whether they're virtual or on site, wind up just being 
sort of a sharing of information that again, a student can find from the internet or an employer can find from a resume. Um, and unfortunately, I think too many of the virtual responses have been taking what we've already done and just put it online versus finding new creative ways to use sort of the technology that allows virtual. Um, so that's my own two cents, not that folks necessarily wanted to hear it. We did get a very specific question that I'm gonna hit, but I wanna hit on something um, with Allison with it. So the question came, how far before I need a micro intern should I sign up and post our project? We typically suggest posting a micro internship 24 to 48 hours before you need to kick off. Students are engaging literally every day. Now, granted, if they have finals, a specific student may not come onto the platform that day, but, but we suggest 24, 48 hours. And where I wanna call on Allison is I know you actually were looking at offering micro internships for students uh, tied to the Nesby conference. Yep. Um, I mean, how far before Nesby did that project get posted? <laughs> um, maybe 72 hours. I think it was closer to maybe 24, somewhere somewhere in that range. It was a very, I think it was Monday to Wednesday or Tuesday, Monday to Wednesday. And, you did, and you did two things that I thought were both super creative. One, you had a student um, create social media content to hopefully drive more students to the Nesby booth, students who may not have heard of Smith and Nephew. But two, and, and this was brand new for us, but I thought it was super smart, offering the opportunity for students who were visiting the booth to actually work on a real paid micro internship for Smith Nephew, to have that opportunity. So as opposed to giving away t-shirts and squish balls and all the other stuff, um, I just I think that was pretty cool. I have to I have to presume it led to some excitement by the students, but you tell me we haven't talked since Nesby. Yeah, no, we had so many students come to our table and we were in the back corner of like and they had to see, seek us out and find us. And I really do think the Parker Dewey website and the opportunity to be able to offer that project to students really helped to drive a lot of traffic. Again, I'm always trying to think creatively and think what's in it for the student. And that's kind of the way that I make some decisions and and think about how we can interact with students in a creative, unique way that's in a cost effective way um, and in a time effective way that that, that just it's a win win again for, for everyone. And so these things come up and I, I bounce them off of Parker Dewey and they're like, hey, wait, this would make it even better or this, you know, so it's been a great partnership to really thank you think flexibly and creatively on how we can bring opportunities to students more often. And, and I'm obviously biased on that topic with regard, like I, I just thought it was super cool because again, I think about how much money companies are spending right. and debating, should we give t-shirts or squish balls or phone chargers or headphones, take all that money and offer two, three, four, five, ten 10 students opportunities to do real projects with your company. Not only are they gonna show up to your career fair booth, but they're gonna engage and you're gonna get insight. So. Um, and the thing for me that's really exciting is the real time ability to 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 utilize and and to find students and to if a hiring manager comes to me and says I want an intern the first thing I can say is is it a project what is it and when do you need them and they're always like yesterday so I'm like okay let's use Parker Dewey because I know I can get this project off the ground really really quickly and and the, in the example of Nesby uh, National Society of Black Engineers. Um, we actually had recently had a student um, who has had to decline the offer that that he accepted for another position um, due to family issues. I right now have a pipeline of students that I can now give to that hire manager and say, look, we don't necessarily, we need to start over a little bit again, but here's some, some students that I can offer up and take a look at these students. And so it's a constant pipeline of students that I can utilize and help respond to hiring managers who always want to hire yesterday and don't understand that they, they can't just hire, um, you know, they want to hire yesterday so I can respond to that. And the other thing that's really important to me is it gives me the opportunity for my employees, I'm talking to them all the time, and in the last couple of weeks, this has happened. Do you have an internship available? I'll say no, but have your son or daughter sign up for Parker Dewey, get on the micro internship um, profile and platform and start to apply for roles that way. And when an internship becomes available, they'll have a little bit of experience ahead of time. So it's a way for me to help pipeline for my employees as well as for my hiring managers real time. 
And that that's that's the um, the secret sauce I feel like for for us. That's awesome. Thank you. Thanks for sharing just that. And again, get... some more ideas on things that oh. I can do. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, well, Debbie, I mean, one of one of the things, first of all, would love to hear some of those ideas that came up. And then also we got another question tied to employment branding and talent marketing. And, and again, building the employer brand on campus is such a hot topic for organizations. Um, what are you seeing emerging with that? And again, would love to hear some of the ideas that came up as well. Uh, yeah. Employers want to reach out to the students. They want to get in front of the students, and and we have to also help this help the uh, employers meet the meet them where they're at. Um, because what I mentioned before, how we've had events in the past, and not a lot of students show up until it's the last minute. I've started inviting employers to our campus to maybe sit in the cafeteria while students are at lunch or at dinner. And then that way they're forced to, the students are forced to interact with the employers. We've also had panel discussions with individual employers um, like we're having here today. We do several of those each semester. And we've also opened up the event portal in our handshake platform, which will allow students to create events for themselves so they can reach out to the students. So it's not just one way is the way. It's a whole bunch of different things. It's and 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 I was just talking to somebody yesterday about social media. If you're posting a message on social media, you can't just depend on Twitter to work for you. You've got to use them all because you don't know where someone is going to notice that message. And the same goes for the employers getting in front of the students. Um, we're trying to help the employers the best way that we can. And, uh, you know, just being me and one other person in my office, it's only the two of us. We've had to get creative and use all of our outlets. Allison, employer branding. I think you hit on some of it already, but not having 30, 50, 100 grand to spend. Yeah, I think you have to be really intentional, intentional, intentional about your social media efforts right you know right to the point that was made you need to know what students want to hear so doing research on that understanding the gen z population and really being where the student is um you know things like work-life balance really important so when we go out on social media that's what we're focusing on we're focusing on um, the positions that are open and our benefits um focusing on work-life balance. So again, just understanding the population that you're trying to reach and doing the research on that, and then being intentional with your social media efforts. Right. I think that that's really, really important. And, and just being authentic. I think that authenticity well, that's... is so important to students and they can see oh through God. it and read through it. So when we yeah. talk about, I mean, Jeffrey, when we talk about going to MESB, National Society of Black Engineers, I can't expect in my first year, which was last year, that I'm going to hire a whole bunch of people and managing my hiring managers and my people leaders' expectations about that is really important. We need to understand that population. We need to develop trust with the population. And then in our second year, we're going to make more strides like we did this year. And then next year, we're going to knock the cover off the ball. So it needs to be more than just a one-year dip in, dip out. It's about developing relationships and developing trust and learning where people are at and then helping them understand how your company um, is a good company for them. One other very tactical question um, for Allison that came in both in the chat and beforehand. Was it difficult to get hiring managers on board with the concept of these short projects, these micro internships? And do you have any sort of best practices or lessons learned you can share with the employers? Oh. I think, I'm sorry, the hiring managers. Yeah. Yes. No, no, I know what, I know what you meant. So, so no, to be honest, um, once I talk to hiring managers about this concept, especially if I'm doing it in the right context. So if someone wants to come in, wants someone to come in for 12 weeks, I, I get that. When I, I start to vet out what the projects are, and I'm starting to hear things like, we need to do some data analytics, or we need to do some data extraction. Or for me, I used um, an intern to develop a, um, a job board global. So hundreds around the, the world, a global job board. Um, a database that represented diversity, I started to realize, okay, we can frame these in a project in a micro internship, and we can get this job done without you needing to add headcount in a very cost efficient way. And if you need to, you can extend the project. So we've had hiring managers that have used in micro interns 
four different times to do different types of projects. So once they establish a relationship, so, so no, okay. when, I, when I talk about micro internships, it's not really hard. I, I, I tend to agree, but again, people were asking and I figured as opposed to me saying it, go ahead, please. Yeah, just one other quick thing about that is we actually just internally on our internal um, communication, you know, every week new things come up. I, we did a whole uh, project, or not a project, but a, an article on micro internships. And I had the hiring managers actually do most of the talking. So it wasn't me. So the other piece of it is to get buy in from the other hiring managers and get them to start talking about the value. And so, so that was the only other piece I wanted to add, Jeffrey. No, that's great. Uh, we're coming to the end of the time, and I could talk to both of you for hours, as you both know. Um, but want to, I, I guess, conclude with one last question, and, and Debbie, we'll start with you. What should the folks on the call not be doing, whether it's employers or schools or, or both? What's something that, that you just don't think they should be doing anymore that's not yeah. driving, that's either expensive and not driving the return or just not effective? Or what, what advice do you have for, for the participants? Yeah. I think it's important to understand that things have changed and the way you might have done something in the past, if you find that it's not working anymore, you got to start thinking outside the box. It's as simple as that. And, and if you're trying to reach students, you have to understand how, how do you talk to students? The way you label your social media, your, your announcements, the way you label your emails, um, the message that you're sending. How do, how do students talk to each other and, and what do they find interesting? How can you attract their attention? Um, and we've, I've hired 11 student workers for our office and I will have them come in and we'll do a focus group and we'll talk about what do students want. If you put yourself in the shoes of the student and try to understand where they're coming from each day and understand their obstacles, then it'll help you decide where you need to go with that and, and how you need, need to make changes. Allison, suggestion for others, something that they probably shouldn't be doing or isn't effective. I think not having a clear strategy and a, a clear way of defining what schools you're gonna go to and why you're going to those schools it can open yourself up to having people come to you, employees come to you and say, we should go to this school, we should go to this school, we should, but not having a clear strategy and how different, pieces of the strategy work together, I think is really important. So I have a school strategy. I go to schools. There's no question about it. We take the traditional approach, but we also have these other strategies that we use to really round out everything that I'm trying to do and the vision that I have for our emerging talent programs at Smith and Nephew. So having a clear strategy that is a three-year, five-year plan. Yes, you can iterate throughout, but but to really have that clear strategy for a number of years, I think is really important. And I hear, talk to employees all the time about, not all the time, but I hear them talking about this and the frustration. I think when you have a clear strategy, your CEO, your CFO can't come in and, and kind of tap at that. They appreciate the strategy. So. That's what and I would say. No, those are both great. And I'm going to add one. My, my comment is stop trying to convince students to engage. Stop trying to blast them with emails or messages or those things. If you give students what they actually want, they're going to show up. And we've seen it time and time and time again. And again, we do zero marketing to college students. We do, we, we actually don't allow colleges or universities to require micro internships as part of their program. And it's not because we don't value that collaboration, not because we don't think they're important, but we believe if you give students what they actually want, they're going to show up. And, and we have seven years of data showing that. And what students are hungry for is, again, information they can't Google. They're hungry to really learn about companies. They're hungry to explore different career paths. They're hungry to build professional relationships. They're hungry to actually find out what it's like working at a certain company or industry or certain folks. If you give them those opportunities, guess what? They're going to show up. And it's a lot easier because back, Allison, I think to your point, it, it's giving you that great pipeline of candidates who are already engaged. They're already excited about Smith Nephew. Back to Debbie's point, it's, it's giving the students the opportunities to do that exploration, not just when they're seniors and saying, uh-oh, I have to find a job, but as early as freshman, sophomore year to start to pick that pathway. And, and again, if you give yeah. them what they want, they'll be there. So with that, 
Thank you so much, Debbie. Thank you so much, Allison. This was amazing. I learned a ton. Uh, Mayra, thank you. I'm looking in the notes. This is awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. You guys are amazing. Um, we're, for everyone on the call, we'll share the recording. We'll share some notes and takeaways. I, I'm just, I'm so appreciative of the great work Allison and Debbie are doing. Thank you for all of that. And again, for anyone that sort of wants to dip their toe in the water, the program that Western Connecticut has where 100% of the funding, including the payment to the student is covered. What a great opportunity. So thank you all with that. This concludes the webinar. If we didn't get to your question, please feel free to email. I'm happy to pass it along. Um, have a wonderful, uh, I guess I was trying to think of what day it was. I was going to say Friday <laughs> Eve. Have a wonderful Thursday Eve. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Take Bye. care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. And Debbie, our, oops, Debbie's gone. Thank you. Thanks again, Allison. Hope Thanks, you find Chris. your robot. Bye.